Vincent Cheng. I'm a postdoc at Academia Seneca in Taiwan. And my research basically tries to understand why people enjoy music, um, not only as a medium of communication, but also the pleasure that we derive and the emotions that we, uh, that we feel when we listen to a song. So um, what I'm particularly interested in is, is trying to understand why we have, why music can give us this sort of empowerment um, just by having a sequence of notes without, uh, without lyrics. And, um, and it's something that fascinates me. And that's why I think it's something that is, um, that is worthy to look at, especially also because um, music is actually around us all the time. I mean, it's hard for anyone to imagine um, just having life without music for a day. I think it's something that is, is quite hard to comprehend. And that's why I think it's, uh, it's also a question that is, uh, that is not only important um, for, for a personal point of view, but also uh, as a society. Briefly speaking, our finding was that there is a Goldilocks zone between um, music that we like that is somewhat predictable, but at the same time, not so predictable. So um, people tend to enjoy, uh, in, our, in our study, chords that were at the same time, um, at one point that is not so predictable that it becomes repetitive, but at the same time, not so unpredictable that it becomes completely random. So there's this trade-off between, um, between being able to predict what is going to happen and um, being surprised by uh, what we listen to that people find the most interesting. And this is what we find uh, from behavioral, uh, behavioral experiment. And also um, from a neural perspective, we also invited participants to listen to chord sequences taken from uh, pop songs um, back from the 1950s to the 1990s. And um, this is the chord progressions from these songs. And we asked them to listen carefully to these pop sequences, uh, pop song sequences. And we find that actually the, um, the brain areas that are involved in processing these expectancies, uh, expectations in music are involved in, for example, in auditory processing. So processing the uh, auditory content of the music, but also uh, in, in emotional processing regions, so namely the amygdala and hippocampus. So what our study tells us here is that there is actually a very intimate connection between um, the interaction between the regions that are involved in sound processing and also in emotional processing. I think 15 years ago, I would have never thought that I'd be involved in doing music, uh, music research. Um, so this is actually quite a funny story. Um, 15 years ago, I decided at university that I should learn a new language uh, on top of studying mathematics. So I decided, oh, why don't I start learning German? And, um, and so by the end of my undergraduate, I thought, okay, uh, I realized that I've been doing maths for, for a bit too long and it, every day it's been uh, very theoretical. And actually I took a course in my uh, third year on uh, theoretical neuroscience. And I thought, wow, this is completely different to what I had expected. So. Um, before in my math, uh, math studies, I was always just proving uh, theorems and so on. And I actually, um, that course was really the first time where I actually got to see how I could put the mathematics I learned into actually something um, applied. And, uh, and so afterwards I, I applied for a master's in Germany and uh, that took me to Berlin. And actually um, being a musician myself, I, I I played a violin and so in university I was involved in orchestra and so on. And I always wondered um, why do I enjoy music so much? Why do I enjoy playing, uh, playing an instrument but also listen uh, to music and go to concert and so on. And so actually I came across a paper by, uh, by my PhD supervisor who, uh, who basically just explained everything. It was like, uh, a very good review on why people enjoy music from a neuroscientific perspective, from a psychological perspective. And I thought, wow, this is the greatest revelation of my life back then. And, um, and it turned out even, uh, well, fortuitously, that, uh, that my supervisor was actually in the same city as I was. And so that was the point where I actually contacted him. And, this is, and that was the point when everything related to music really began. And then so eventually I, uh, I, I continued my research with him and that's when I did my PhD uh, on the topic that I did, which is on the expectations of music and how that affects um, the pleasure that we get. 
Prediction is a very, very important mechanism in cognition. Actually, a very influential theory of uh, cognition is something called predictive coding, which basically uh, tries to explain how we understand the world around us. And uh, in a nutshell, this theory says that we try to create our conscious um, surroundings, or, or in other words, we try to be aware of our surroundings by actively trying to predict what is going on. So basically this process assumes that we, we generate continuous um, uh, predictions of our sensory environment. And um, what we then do is with our senses, we generate feedback. We, we receive feedback from, uh, from our senses and these, uh, and these um, signals are then updated um, so that we generate new predictions again. And basically you can think of it as a cycle where we continuously try to guess what is going on around us and update our beliefs uh, to try to minimize something called prediction error. So this is a general mechanism of how, um, of how we think um, neurons uh, sort of um, communicate with one another in order to generate our sort of conscious, our consciousness. And, uh, and we sort of think that actually this principle general, uh, generalizes very well to, uh, to music perception. So uh, basically what we find here. And so I think it's, it's a nice demonstration of how, uh, how mechanisms on a very small scale can actually uh, be representative, representative of something that is a more higher level. So things like uh, music cognition, for example. The finding that I have in, in, this, uh, in this study is, is a surprise in itself. So um, what, I find very, what I found very interesting is that actually within the music literature, um, there's actually been sort of a contradiction going on um, in the sense that people, of course, we intuitively think that, okay, we like songs that are, that are somewhat uh, surprising, uh, but at the same time, not too boring. However, um, actually, uh, if we look at studies in the past 10 years, people generally tend to find that people don't like surprises. So uh, for example, if you present uh, chord sequences that are somewhat uh, unexpected, people sort of, uh, sort of think that the more unexpected it is, the, the more uh, that they dislike it. And at the same time, um, there are also studies that find that um, uh, people tend to uh, enjoy songs that are more familiar. So in other words, um, there's also a sense of, um, well, I wouldn't say aversion, but uh, people tend to like things that are more familiar to them. And so this sort of speaks against uh, the, uh, the idea that um, surprises in music would be somewhat pleasurable. Um, However, um, in our study, what we actually find is that it's not only the surprise itself that really uh, determines whether a person likes uh, chords, uh, for example, um, certain chords in a song, but actually it depends on um, how much we're able to predict what is going on. So really it's this trade-off between our ability to, uh, to be certain about what is going to happen next, and also at the same time be surprised uh, as our predictions are somewhat violated. It's this a balance, this critical balance that really makes a difference between what we like and what we dislike. I think science is really about managing the unexpected because of course uh, every scientific finding is a new finding. And, uh, and so it's about being able to ask the right questions and be able to manage these uh, uncertainties in what's going on. Of course, because uh, with the scientific method, that we're never, we'll never actually be able to deduce any scientific reality. What we can have is just uh, empirical evidence that uh, allows us to continuously refine any sort of hypoth hypotheses or theories that we have. And, um, and so one thing I think is very, uh, that, that I think is very useful, act, well, ax I wouldn't say a maxim, but I think an important pr guiding principle that I have so an important guiding principle that I have when I do science is, uh, is something that Carl Sagan used to say. Uh, he, uh, this is a quote from Carl Sagan, is that um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I think this is a, uh, I think this perspective is very, uh, is very healthy when we do science in the sense that it's always important to have a healthy dose of skepticism. And if something doesn't feel right, then um, it's important to challenge um, these claims and to make sure that uh, to make sure that they're actually not something that is, um, that is a confound, that is a fluke, but actually uh, a new finding. 